Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks for joining me in this session. My name is Yun Ping. I'm a software engineer at Uber. I'm working on building and maintaining compute infrastructure at Uber. So in today's talk, I'm going to share the lessons and the takeaways my team has learned from evaluating and exploring Kubernetes migration for Uber. OK, this is the agenda of today's talk. We will first take an overview of Uber and Uber's compute infrastructure and explain the team's motivation of moving to Kubernetes. Then we will dive into the evaluation and exploration experience of Kubernetes migration at Uber. At the end, we will summarize our learnings into a few takeaways and share with the audience today. OK, before we kicking off any technical discussion, let's first take a look at Uber's business scale. So Uber has completed more than 15 billion cumulative trips. Over 15 million Uber trips happen on the platform every day. Now Uber is available in more than 700 cities across 65 countries on six continents. Uber has surpassed 100 million monthly active users in June 2019 and over 3.9 million active drivers globally in Q4 2018. As a company, Uber now has more than 27,000 employees worldwide and more than 3,000 engineers worldwide. To build and operate such a large commute platform, there are thousands of software systems and services constantly running behind the scene. And Uber has built its own computer infrastructure to, at scale to support these systems and the services. Let's start with a few statistics to review the scale of Uber's compute infrastructure. Uber currently has thousands of microservices running. On development activities, Uber engineers build more than 5,000 of container images every day deploy more than 1,000 of microservices and more than 10,000 of container instances every day. Regarding the compute cluster footprint, Uber has more than 35 clusters across different regions and the different zones, with more than 100,000 services containers per cluster, and has a million batch container launched per day at a peak time. So the stateless service is actually the main resource consumer on the massive compute platform Uber has built. Uber models its stateless workload as microservices. As we mentioned previously, there are thousands of microservices running on the Uber platform. They are mostly containerized and are right now running on the Mesos cluster. To get to the current state, Uber has gone through a few major migrations. At the beginning, everything was running on bare metal, no containerization at all. In early 2015, Uber started to containerize services and it deployed its own container orchestration system to support static containers placement. In 2016, Uber adopted Apache Mesos and Apache Aurora as its new resource management and container orchestration system. Later on, Uber also deployed and it developed its own Mesos scheduler, as known as Peloton, to replace Aurora. So fairly speaking, if you're looking at the history of Uber compute infrastructure, it's a long journey full of migrations. Also, from the bigger picture, the entire Uber infrastructure, including compute, is expanding into multiple regions and multiple zones, with a tripod strategy underneath. Basically, we're building and maintaining infrastructure on-promise and in the cloud simultaneously. So besides the massive amount of stateless workload, there are also other use cases on the Uber compute infrastructure. There are large volume of batch workload running on compute clusters, and we are co-locating mixed workload, including both stateless and the batch on the shared clusters. For workload that requires hardware customization, Compute infrastructure actually offers centralized support to run them on dedicated hardwares. Also, compute infrastructure also supports the D3 
distributed deep learning workload on GPU resource. So given the use cases we have, Uber Compute Team has developed its own customized resource scheduler, as known as Peloton, as I mentioned. It mainly fulfills the following needs. It's a unified resource scheduler for co-locating mixed workload on compute clusters. It integrates with different applications orchestration systems, such as Spark, TensorFlow, and Uniploy. It can be run both on-premise or in the cloud. And more importantly, it supports elastic resource sharing among teams and organizations. So the diagram on the right side briefly describes the role of Peloton in the Uber Compute infrastructure. As a unified resource scheduler, it bridges between resource management system and a variety of different service orchestration systems for different use cases. So, so far we have gone through the overview of Uber Compute Infrastructure, and I haven't mentioned any single word rela uh, related to cloud native and Kubernetes. So, people may ask, it seems Uber has already developed an entire compute ecosystem based on Apache Mesos, and it's working fine right now. Why we are talking about Kubernetes? And let me share with you guys, here is the why. So the actual motivation to migrate to Kubernetes derived from the real business requirements. So a big challenge Uber engineering team currently faces is how to ensure authentication and authorization for inter-service communication among thousands of microservices. A common solution would be just building a secure service mesh. It will help address the security and the compliance concerns without having to change the code of thousands of microservices. So to build a secure service mesh, Uber Compute Infrastructure needs to support pod and sidecars. But unfortunately, the existing Mesos-based architecture doesn't really support pod, and it's not easily extensible. Since it requires using task groups and the nested containers feature with unified containerizer in Mesos, which is only supported by Mesos. In this case, if we use it, we will actually lose the container runtime portability. Hence, we started to actually explore other alternatives. It's not hard to realize that Kubernetes has native support for pod, sidecar, security plugins, and init containers. So these are all necessary or useful features to build secure service mesh. Additionally, we also impressed by the thriving community support Kubernetes has. And if we build a new solution on top of Kubernetes, it will be natively supported by new cloud native applications as well. So at this point, it's very clear to the team that Kubernetes-based secure service mesh solution would be a better alternative to go with if that's possible. But what this really means? So basically, this means a major iteration on the core technologies that currently powers Uber Compute Infrastructure. We must first evaluate this is indeed a viable solution for existing business needs as well. So there are two major concerns people raised against Kubernetes internally in Uber. The first one is scalability. So we often heard people questioning about Kubernetes cluster scaling ability beyond 5K nodes. And currently, Uber already have clusters larger than 5K nodes. Uber Compute Infrastructure also runs large volume of batch workload. We have to ensure Kubernetes can handle the existing batch workload footprint within Uber. The second concern we have is around portability. So as we mentioned in the overview, Uber has existing customized service orchestration systems for different use cases and they support unique service deployment characteristics, such as instance count-based sharding and in-place upgrade. We need to ensure the technology iteration underneath is easily portable to those upstream services and systems as well. So after gathering feedback and summarizing the concerns, as engineers who thrive for technologies, we decided to go ahead and evaluate and address those concerns. 
So we focused on scalability first. The basic methodology to evaluate a software system's scalability is benchmarking. So we started with benchmarking at CD, since it is the persistent storage solution Kubernetes uses underneath. So we evaluated SCD write throughput against the key size and the value size. On its public announced documents, SCD claimed it can support up to 50K writes per second and 150K reads per second. This far exceeds our needs, but we wanted to run additional benchmarking against a large value size. The sample benchmarking result on the right side demonstrates the throughput, uh, demonstrate that though the value size actually affects SCD's throughput performance, but it can still provide good read through, write throughput with large value size. Second, given how Kubernetes actually use SCD, we also wanted to run additional benchmarking against the number of watches on SCD. It turned out SCD write throughput drops significantly after hundreds of watches connected but it is still acceptable for the cluster footprint Uber may have. So besides the right throughput, we also evaluated memory consumption with SCD against the number of watches. It turned out that our SCD can actually handle millions of watches with a few gigabytes of memory. So after getting enough confidence on the storage layer, we moved on to benchmarking SCD together with Kube API Server. This time, we used the simple test clients to create pods with random node binding against API Server directly. And we got some bad news on the throughput performance. So as an example, benchmark results showed launching 40K pods on 8K nodes took a few minutes. This is not really a convincing result for Kubernetes migration. But we didn't stop there, because one interesting thing we noticed in the benchmark result is the number of pod events stored in SCD actually 10 times of, is 10 times of the number of pods, as we showed off in one example graph on the right side. So to find out why, we went back and dig deeper into the pod events. So after some code reading and researching, we had some pretty interesting findings. It turns out that the large volume of pod events consume network and storage resources for both Kubernetes API server and SCD. But they are not really persisted states that Kubernetes leverage to operate pods. They are more as locks. In fact, having TTL config on them also indicates the same conclusion. At the same time, we also engaged with folks from other companies. They shared the same thoughts. It helped us confirm that, that this is actually the right direction to go with. Based on the new learnings, we re-ran the benchmarking against SCD and Kube API server again, but this time we are dropping all the pod events. The throughput had significant improvements. It only took 30 seconds to launch 40K pods on 8K nodes which is a pretty decent benchmark result to demonstrate the scalability of SCD and Kube API server. So besides the benchmark efforts I just mentioned, we also did performance evaluation around pod deletion, Kube API server resource consumption, and et cetera. Okay, so after a few rounds of scalability evaluation, we agreed on the following statements. So SCD performance is heavily impacted by number of watches, which is more or less linear to the number of nodes. But overall, it's a good enough for Uber's footprint. SCD plus Kube API server performance on pod creation and launch is also good enough for Uber's footprint after dropping the pod events. So as a conclusion, scalability of SCD and Kube API server it's not really a concern for migration to Kubernetes for Uber. Next, we moved on to address the portability concerns. With the scalability evaluation conclusion in mind, as we mentioned above, Uber already has Peloton as a unified resource scheduler. It provides unique values to the Uber ecosystem. 
we need to carefully consider how the integration would work. The first alternative we came up with is to actually modify Peloton to become a Kubernetes scheduler plugin. This diagram on the right side briefly demonstrates how the overall solution would look like. Basically, SCD, Kube API Server, and Kubelet was adopted directly. Peloton will be modified as a Kubernetes scheduler plugin, and we need to develop custom controllers to bridge existing service orchestration system with Kubernetes API. So there are obviously pros and cons for this alternative. For the pros, this is basically uh, idiomatic for Kubernetes ecosystem because we are leveraging the suggested plugin model to implement custom schedulers on top of Kubernetes. And also, in this way, we can actually reuse a lot of Kubernetes functionalities. And the team in overall agree, eventually, this is how we should get. But there's also cons. The first one is the change is at a very large scale. So especially considering if this is the first step of a migration, it would be very risky. Second, the migration is kind of costly because essentially we need to swap the underneath APIs the upper stream systems are using from Peloton to Kubernetes API. And no need to say, because you can tell from the graph, we need to build actually many translation layers to bridge between the systems with Kubernetes API server. Okay, the other alternatives we also considered is to actually have Peloton integrating with both Kubernetes and Mesos mostly as it is right now. So looking at architecture diagram on the right side, Peloton host manager will be responsible for southbound integration with Mesos master and Kubernetes API server. There should be no significant changes for the northbound API integration with a variety of upstream systems. In this alternative, Kubernetes and the Mesos can actually share the same Peloton control plane, and the Peloton host manager will hide away details of Kubernetes and the Mesos from upstream systems. And the same Peloton jobs back, in this case, can be launched on either Mesos or Kubernetes clusters. Okay, if we zoom into the integration point for the second alternative further, this alternative essentially requires to build an abstracted interface to operate an internal host cache within Peloton Host Manager. It requires a plugin implementation for both Kubernetes and Mesos. The Mesos plugin will be responsible for communicating with Mesos Master, and the KS plugin will be responsible for communicating with Kube API Server. The pros of the second alternative is it will allow Mesos and Kubernetes to share the same Peloton scheduler. The scope of this change is much smaller compared with the first alternative. And most importantly, it makes the swap invisible to clients and helps to achieve a transparent migration. As an opposite to the other alternative, this solution is not idiomatic. It doesn't really leverage the Kubernetes scheduler plugin model and there are fundamental differences between Mesos and Kubernetes, which actually raised a bunch of consistency challenges when designing the host cache inside Peloton Host Manager. So now let's go back to the portability concerns we presented previously. Apparently, the second alternative stands out. Since it doesn't really swap the northbound API from Peloton to Kubernetes, and the integration challenge, the integration changes required from different existing systems on top of Peloton are well scoped and limited. It keeps Peloton as the schedulers on Kubernetes. It provides more flexibility to ensure support for those existing unique service deployment characters, characteristics. So as a conclusion, we decided to choose the second alternative to go with Basically, we are making Peloton talk to both Kubernetes and the Mesos via an abstracted interfaces. So after evaluating the scalability and the portability challenges, we are convinced 
Migration to Kubernetes is viable within the compute infrastructure for Uber. But in, in the entire Uber ecosystem, there are broader integration challenges we need to solve. So I'm list I listed a few of examples here. The first one is logging. So Uber currently builds and maintains custom logging infrastructure based on Kafka and the Elasticsearch. As part of the Kubernetes migration, compute team needs to come up with a solution to integrate Uber logging infrastructure with Kubernetes. The next one is security. For example, Uber's security engineers are looking into using Spire for service identity. Then compute team needs to work with the security engineers to provide proper integration with Spire in Kubernetes. Another big challenge is Uber builds its own service discovery and routing solution back in 2016 to solve specific problems Uber was facing. To figure out a solution to support existing service discovery and routing without making changes in the thousands of microservices. These are only examples among all the integration challenges compute team needs to solve. In the next few slides, I will dig, into, dig a little bit deeper into two cases to share some learnings the team has already got. The first case study, let's look into logging. So any logging solution compute team provides within Uber needs to satisfy the following requirements. It needs to support, it needs to support container logging to standard out, standard error, and on disk files. The logs on the local host needs to be persisted even after killing the pods. And it needs to support custom log file locations. So basically, for the Kubernetes migration, the first half of the solution we provided is based on Kubernetes Container Runtime Interface. So Kubernetes Container Runtime Interface is a plugin interface which enables Kubelet to use a, a wide variety of container runtime technologies without the need of recompile. The CRI mainly consists of a protocol, pro, a protocol buffers, gRPC API, and the libraries works as a middleware between Kubelet and the actual container runtime. It provides the ability to manipulate requests and pod sandbox lifecycle. So this flow chart shows a few key RPCs in the CRI. I will walk through it to describe the customization we introduced here. So first, before running pod sandbox is the Uber pod UID annotation will be injected into the request annotation, and it will contain the pod UID associated with the sandbox. This annotation will be needed later in the remove sandbox call in order to remove the host log directories associated with the sandbox. So before creating the container is called, the request will be inspected, and if Uber logging host directory is defined, then a mount will be created with the host path and the container path as defined in the annotations. The mount will be injected into the container creation request. After stop pod sandbox is called and succeeds, the timestamp that the sandbox was stopped at will be recorded. And before remove pod sandbox is called, CRI will actually check the timestamp of when the sandbox has been stopped. CRI will fail the sandbox removal request with an aborted state if it is not enough time has passed since the remove sandbox in the future. By default, Kubernetes will try again to remove the sandbox. CRI will allow the request to continue only if there has been enough time passed since the sandbox was actually stopped. So this customization in the CRI actually allows us to specify locations of local log files associated with the pod ID and set up host direction, a host directory mount. It also allows us to persist local logs for a configurable short time window even after killing the pods. So the second half of the solution is a custom Docker logging driver. 
It is responsible for logging to standard out and a standard error, and supports streaming them into separate files. It also supports custom log file location, which is actually not supported in the Docker default JSON format logging driver. Additionally, it also handles lossless log rotation and optional log compression. So combining the CRI customization and the custom docking logging driver together, we actually provided a logging solution meets all the requirements to integrate it with Uber logging infrastructure. Okay, let's move on. The second case study we're gonna talk about, basically we were looking into cluster networking. So you guys probably can recall, I have mentioned several times in the presentation that Uber has its own, basically a different cluster networking setup compared with Kubernetes primitives. And it is actually a big challenge for Kubernetes migration at Uber. In Kubernetes, every pod gets its own IP. But in Uber's Mesos clusters right now, all the containers actually share the host network namespace. Uber's software networking system relies on host IP and dynamic ports allocation for service discovery and routing. As a result of this, there is actually no IP tables management in Uber's compute infrastructure. Additionally, there are also services running on our Mesos clusters that talk to other services directly over localhost or loopback IP. It is actually hard-coded in the service source code. So these three bullet points summarizes how the current cluster networking setup looks like in Uber. We have to come up with a cluster networking solution to migrate for Kubernetes without impacting discovery and routing for thousands of microservices. And the solution we come up with is actually using CNI plugin, and again, together with the CRI customization. So the diagram on the right side briefly demonstrates how the network traffic is forwarded. For example, the egress traffic from the service container will be first forwarded to the routing sidecar container pod first. Then, the traffic coming out of the routing sidecar will go through CNI port mapping plugin and be forwarded to the host network namespace and eventually leaves the host. It allows us to actually adopt Kubernetes IP per pod primitives and still using the existing host IP and a dynamic port allocation based service discovery and routing solution. To solve the service dependency on static port on host network namespace, we have to ensure that services can talk to a list of whitelisted ports over loopback IP. When a container is started, the customization in CRI modifies the IP table to the pod networking namespace to redirect packets from selected ports on the pod's localhost to the same set of ports on the host localhost. This customization in CRI will also clean up the IP table rules before stopping the sandbox, the pod sandbox. So combining these two pieces of work together, we are able to migrate the gap, to mitigate the gap in cluster networking setup without actually modifying the source code of thousands of services. Okay. So we finally reached the end of all the technical discussions we would like to share in this talk. But more importantly, we summarized the learnings Uber compute team got from evaluating and exploring Kubernetes migration for Uber in the past few months into three key takeaways. We want to actually share them with the audience today. So the first one is active community engagement is very important. For example, when we're making the decision of dropping pod events, engaging with the community and talking with engineers from other companies actually allow us to learn from the work other people already, already did and help us confirm the right technical decision we are going to make. Second, hands-on evaluation actually helped in decision making a lot. We gained the confidence on SCD and the Kubernetes API server scaling ability from a comprehensive benchmarking work. And this confidence became the foundations to help us make a proper decision on Peloton and the Kubernetes integration later on. 
At last, portability is actually the key of massive migration. At companies like Uber, any infrastructure migration, and infrastructure migration is, like, is very likely to fail if it actually requires changes in upstream systems and thousands of services. Why? When solving a variety of integration challenges, the team always take the portability into consideration and make the migration as transparent as we can. That's all. So please raise your hand if you want to ask a question. I will give you a micro microphone. Hi. Uh, how long does it take to perform this migration? Uh, so fairly speaking, all the work we have presented are only for exploring and evaluation. So we are pro as an engineer team, we're providing a proper technical solution to the management to actually demonstrate how the migration would look like and how we will scope the work. So it's actually up, uh, up to the management to decide when and uh, how much resource is proper for the company to actually invest in this migration. So fairly speaking, none of the solution is actually working in production right now. Hi, with the uh, sidecar and the plug-in, what was the latency added? Was there any added for, the, for networking? So the uh, routing sidecar latency, uh, I don't really have the data at hand, but we probably have team members around. Maybe we can chat offline. How, how do you actually drop part events? I have never seen that before. So there are a few tricks we can play around, and actually, uh, during the uh, researching, back to the time when we was looking at the performance, uh, the team found a very long thread uh, on Git issues on Kubernetes. It's basically talking about should we actually transform pod invents into logs. And there are a few tricks. The way how we do it is you can either, for example, throw out a proxy layer on top of Kubernetes API servers to fill out all the pod invents queries. And you can also potentially shorter the TTL config for your pod invents. So there's basically a few different tricks you can play with. And another solution people come up with, so instead of storing the pod events together with other critical pod states in the same SCD cluster, you can redirect and separate the pod events into a separate ATCD cluster. Yeah, so there are a few ways we can do it. Sure, so uh, you say that you chose the second option. Uh, so what's your roadmap? Do you want to continue with this? Uh, combination of Bezos and Kubernetes, or is it that you, over a period of time, you want to migrate all the services from Mesos to, is, is that the direction, or do you want to continue with both? Uh, good question. So um, choosing the second alternative in terms of Peloton and the Kubernetes integration is mainly focusing on the portability concerns. It's not really for actually trying to keep both Mesos and Kubernetes. It's mostly trying to make the underneath swap from Mesos agents, for example, to Kubeless, transparent to the upper clients. So the long-term goal definitely, well, so based on the evaluation we have, the long-term goal should eventually migrate off Mesos ecosystem and fully up to the Kubernetes ecosystem. Okay, so I had a uh, question. So generally when you run like a system at scale and it's been identified by some of the people and you're reconfiguring the sidecar policies at a frequent time, those reconfigurations can cause like a lot of pod events which can cause like basically the network not to scale. So, but in your case, you just mentioned you can drop if pod events, but how do you plan to scale if there's like a lot of reconfiguration going on? Uh, sorry, I didn't catch a question. A lot of what? So, uh, how, like, you might have to reconfigure the pod, uh, so the sidecar uh, pro proxies or the pods. And it's been shown that earlier that when there's a lot of sidecars, or these proxies, and if you're reconfiguring them, which this can cause like a scalability issue. How do you handle this? Or how do you plan to handle this? Uh, that's a pretty good question because as soon as we dive deep into the uh, pod plus sidecar uh, models, we realize that sidecar is actually pretty expensive to be honest. It's something that you should probably be careful with when you're introducing new sidecars. So I can give a brief 
estimation, for example, right now on the Uber computer infrastructure, uh, we have more than 10 sort of infra agents or say host agents running. If we think about cost, uh, containerizing every single of them into a, a converting in them into a sidecar, it's, it's basically causing a massive amount of resource waste, potentially, as well as some churns in the cluster performance as well. So that's a very good question. I don't really have a good answer for you, but one thing I can say is uh, one sort of principle the team is taking is when we're thinking of a need of a sidecar, we are very careful and thoughtful. We only introduce sidecar only if it is necessary. Okay, thank you. All right, unfortunately we run out of time, so please give up around, now a round of applause to Yunpeng, and uh, you can continue discussion in the corridor, catch him.